Why is Mercury the most difficult planet to visit despite being close to Earth? Even though Mercury is the second closest planet to Earth, this is also the most challenging planet to visit. But why? Is it because it's too close to the Sun? Because of its high temperatures? Or will the composition of the planet have something to do with it? The answer will surprise you. The closest planet to Earth is Venus. Yes, you heard right, Venus. Although it is popularly said that the planet more like Earth is Mars, the closest is Venus because it is only 25 million miles from the Earth at its closest point. Does that mean that the second closest to Earth is Mars? No, the second closest planet to Earth is Mercury, since the shortest distance between Earth and Mercury is 48 million miles. The average distance between Earth and Mars is about 55 million miles. During perihelion, the distance between Earth and Mars is drastically reduced to just 36 million miles. Yet this only happens once every 26 months. So most of the time, Mars is farther from Earth than Mercury. When humanity began exploring the solar system's planets with spacecraft, the first planet to be visited was Venus in 1962 followed by Mars in 1965 and Jupiter in 1973. We had to wait until 1974 for the Mariner space probe to visit the planet Mercury for the first time. Subsequently, in the following years, several space exploration probes were sent to study the farthest planets of the solar system in 1974, 1979, 1992, 1995, 2000, and recently in 2007. Several missions have been launched to explore Mars and the outer planets, and even study asteroids and faraway comets. But Mercury did not receive a single mission for 30 years. Was it because the Mariner 10 exploration probe gave us all the information we needed for Mercury, and there was nothing more to discover? No, the Mariner probe only managed to fly over Mercury three times, and during those three flybys, it only managed to map 40% of the planet's surface. Scientists were very interested in continuing to study this planet, since it was fascinating for scientific research. And the reason why they had not sent more exploration probes to study this planet is that it was the most challenging of all. But why is Mercury the most difficult planet to visit? The most challenging planet. The reasons why it is so difficult to visit Mercury can be divided into two, temperature and speed. Let's start with temperature. It's no secret that Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun. Because of this, the temperature on its surface usually reaches 806 degrees Fahrenheit. These temperatures are very high for the circuits and components of any space exploration probe. So the ships sent to the planets closest to the Sun must be equipped with protective panels that protect the equipment from the scorching sun temperatures. These panels are usually placed on only one side of the ship, and with the help of the communication antennas, these are always kept pointing at the sun to protect the ship's instruments. Secondly, we have the most crucial reason it is so difficult to send ships to Mercury, the proximity to the sun. As you know, all bodies with mass exert a force of gravitational attraction that attracts other smaller objects towards them. The sun is the most massive object in the entire solar system, this means that as the ships approach the Sun, you are accelerating more and more until there comes a point where they become difficult to control. This is one of the problems that have most caused the loss of space probes in the vicinity of the Sun. Maneuvering such an accelerated ship only with rockets is a challenging task to achieve, since usually space exploration probes do not carry as much fuel because they are much smaller than a human crewed ship. Minimize weight as much as possible. When it comes to spacecraft, engineers will always try to keep everything as light as possible, because the heavier a ship weighs, the more fuel it will take to get it off the ground. And the more fuel you need, the more expensive the mission will be, which is not at all attractive if you have a shoestring budget. The more fuel is placed in a space exploration probe, the less space there will be to place scientific instruments, which in the end are the most important. However, for 30 long years, scientists and engineers did not find any way in which a probe with little fuel could accelerate so fast as to reach Mercury. 
But that changed in 1985 when scientist Chen Wen Yan, an MIT graduate in nuclear physics, proposed a way to reach the planet Mercury with the technology available at the time. A risky route. To reach Mercury with the technology available at the time, Chen Wen Yan used his knowledge in orbital mechanics and developed a very particular route in which a spacecraft could travel an enormous distance, passing through several planets, which would slow it down enough to be captured by Mercury's gravity using very little fuel. Instead of sending a spacecraft directly to Mercury, Chen Wen Yan's new route charted a much longer path in which the spacecraft would have to circle the Sun about 15 times before reaching Mercury's orbit. The probe in charge of carrying out this complicated mission would be the Messenger space probe, and to achieve this feat, the spacecraft would use the gravitational assistance of Earth, Venus, and Mercury, passing through the Earth once, Venus twice, and Mercury three times. With each flyby, the average speed of Messenger relative to the Sun would gradually increase, but the speed of the spacecraft relative to Mercury would decrease. How is this? Imagine you want to get on a train from a moving car. The train travels 60 miles per hour along the tracks parallel to Main Street and will pass through the general store precisely at 1 p.m. You're geared up for action parked along Main Street in your car. At 12.59.30, you start accelerating down the street to intercept the train. Your car's starting point is closer to the general store than where the train is now. But the train is going faster, 60 miles per hour, and both are going in the same direction. As you accelerate up to 10 miles per hour relative to your starting point, you're going 50 miles per hour relative to the train. When you increase your speed relative to your starting point, the store, your speed relative to the train decreases. You're getting closer. You calculate your acceleration to pass the store at precisely 60 miles per hour while the train passes. You will go to 0 miles per hour about the train and 60 miles per hour about the store. Similarly, the Messenger Exploration Probe used the gravitational assistance of the planets to accelerate relative to the Sun, by getting closer and closer to the speed of Mercury. Once Messenger approached Mercury at the right speed, it could fire its main engine enough to be captured by the planet's gravity and begin orbiting it. Messenger Scan Probe Messenger was a relatively small exploration probe launched on August 3rd, 2004, measuring just 1.3 meters wide and weighing just over a ton. The probe had a propellant thruster to help it maneuver and control its direction. This heat shield protected equipment from high temperatures and two solar panels that unexpectedly scientists used as solar sails that helped slow down the spacecraft's speed a bit due to the solar wind. The sun emits solar radiation that spreads throughout the solar system. This radiation falls on the spacecraft and pushes them very slightly. Though the thrust of the solar wind is tiny and typically does not influence the trajectories of the spacecraft. Because the journey of the messenger probe was going to be so long and last so many years, it was a great help to slow down. And so the scientists tried to keep the solar panels pointing at the sun at all times, so the probe saved a lot of fuel, which helped it extend its useful life. Messenger made all its orbits correctly and without many complications, passing through the Earth, Venus, and finally approaching Mercury three times until it managed to be captured by its gravity on March 11, 2011. Messenger's entire route covered approximately 4.9 billion miles and took approximately seven years to complete the entire journey. Once Messenger reached Mercury's orbit, it began to perform eccentric orbits, alternating its distance between 125 miles and 9,320 miles of Mercury. This was done because Mercury's surface acts as a giant solar mirror that radiates a lot of heat into space. If a spacecraft stays too long close to Mercury, even with a heat shield, it could damage some equipment or, in the worst case, cause ship failures. The Sun has a brightness seven times more intense on Mercury than on the Earth, which is why it was decided that the probe would perform eccentric orbits that would allow it to approach and move away from Mercury periodically to cool off from the high temperatures reflected by the planet. During the next four years, the Messenger probe would be responsible for sending thousands of photographs of the surface of Mercury, providing essential information that would help us understand 
the planet's chemical composition, the geography of its surface, and its internal structure. Finally, on April 30, 2015, the fuel of the Messenger probe ran out, and the scientist in charge of the mission decided to crash the ship into Mercury, thus ending one of the most important missions in history. Thanks to the Messenger mission, a significant discovery was achieved. In the images sent by the probe, indications have been observed that could demonstrate the existence of frozen water at the poles of Mercury. Currently, the European Space Agency ESA, and the Japanese Space Agency JAXA have launched a new mission that will be responsible for revealing once and for all if Mercury can have water or not. This is the Bepi Colombo mission, and it is estimated that it will reach the orbit of Mercury in 2025. Why is it so difficult to get to Mars? In addition to Earth, Mars is the planet with the best conditions to host humans. Space agencies such as SpaceX or NASA are planning to take the next generation of astronauts to the Red Planet, but it has not yet been achieved. Why is it so difficult to get to Mars? Let's start. During the space race in the 60s, NASA successfully took six missions to the Moon that placed 12 astronauts on the surface of our natural satellite. Having gone to the moon several times nearly five decades ago and is used to seeing astronauts travel to space almost routinely, having extended stays on the International Space Station, it's tempting to think that sending humans to Mars could be perfectly plausible today. However, to the current date in 2022, seeing the first humans on the red planet still seems to be distant. Science and technology tell us that sending human beings to Mars constitutes a challenge of enormous difficulty and complexity that is far from everything that has been done so far in the history of human exploration of space. But the reason almost all others are derived from is one, distance. Mars is far away. We see astronauts frequently travel to space, to the International Space Station, the ISS. Before that, for years, cosmonauts traveled to the Mir station aboard Soyuz ships, and currently Taikonauts travel frequently to the Tiangong Space Station in China. Popularly, one has the impression that the place to which one travels in these missions is very distant. However, the typical altitudes at which these stations and spacecraft orbit Earth are a few hundred kilometers. The ISS, for example, orbits the Earth at an altitude that is equivalent to the distance in a straight line between Madrid and Almeria, about 400 kilometers. This space region to which humans routinely travel is within the so-called region of low Earth orbits and technically we call it LEO, Low Earth Orbit. Lunar manned travel involves traveling beyond LEO orbit since the Moon orbits our planet at an average distance of about 380,000 kilometers, which is about 1,000 times farther than the altitudes of these low orbits. A crew and their spacecraft are put into orbit around the Earth shortly after launch, while the distance to the Moon was covered on the Apollo missions in about three days. In the case of Mars, the situation is very different. Going to Mars involves moving from a geocentric mission to a sun-centered orbit, or heliocentric, which is a massive leap in the distances involved. Although the maximum and minimum distances between Earth and Mars vary within a specific range, the minimum possible distance is about 55 million kilometers. This distance is achieved every 26 months when Mars and Earth have an approach gap that lasts a few weeks. These are huge distances compared to all manned missions to space so far. The maximum distance to Mars is 1,000 times greater than that between the Earth and the Moon, and approximately 1 million times greater than the distance separating the Earth's surface from the LEO orbits to which one travels typically. In other words, a single trip to Mars is equivalent to 1 million trips to the ISS space station. Without needing to know anything else, the data about the distance to Mars already constitute an excellent clue to glimpse the magnitude of the problem. To appreciate it better and without going into details related to propulsion methods or orbital dynamics, we will compare two human crewed missions in round numbers. An orbital mission around the Earth for a single crew member and a lunar mission for three crew members. We start with the first orbital mission of the Mercury program of the early 60s, John Glenn's Mercury 6. In this mission, a 120-ton Atlas rocket was used, with a height of 29 meters. It managed to put a useful mass of 1.2 tons into orbit 
at an average altitude of 200 kilometers around the Earth. The cargo was a Mercury capsule with its only crew member, who remained in space for five hours. Let's see what changes the situation by having the Moon as a destination about 1,000 times farther away. In the case of Apollo 17, the last lunar exploration mission, its command and service module plus its lunar module, adding everything, are about 50 tons, were launched to the Moon by the mighty Saturn V rocket of about 3,000 tons and 110 meters high for a mission of a total duration of about 12 and a half days, in which two of its crew remained on the lunar surface just over three days. In contrast, the third remained inside the ship throughout the mission. We see that the quantitative leap needed when we want to go to another world that is 1,000 times beyond the low orbits of Earth is enormous. On the one hand, the useful load to be launched happens to be 1.2 to 50 tons, while the size of the launch rocket happens to be 120 to 3,000 tons. Compare all this to a mission to Mars. For a mission to Mars, the crew will consist of six astronauts, and its duration taking as an example the approaching gap in 2037 would be 174 days for the outbound and 201 days for the return, with a stay of 539 days on Mars. Such an extended stay on Mars would be necessary for the hope that the relative position between this planet and Earth would be optimal for the return with minimal fuel expenditure, which saves the shipment of hundreds of tons of fuel. This represents 914 days of stay on the Red Planet, or approximately two and a half years. As we can see, the jump between the Moon and Mars is enormous, since doubling the crew and extending the duration to about 73 times that of the longest lunar mission means the need to provide and transport about 150 times more supplies. On the other hand, a longer duration of interplanetary travel means the need to provide the crew with more excellent protection against radiation, which is achieved in part by adding even more mass to the ships. Currently, this problem is not entirely solved. Another problem with a long-lasting trip is that things break down. Either the durability of the equipment will have to be substantially improved or they will have to be able to be replaced by spare parts that will also have to be transported, which implies a greater mass. Cargo spacecraft visiting the ISS can stock up on spare parts when something goes wrong on board, but this option will not be possible on a mission to Mars. Anything that can break will have to be repaired or exchanged for the same parts on board. Tons of fuel for a single trip Experience tells us that breaking a train is much more complex than breaking a truck, because the former has more mass and therefore needs more time to break. Sending more mass to Mars also means transporting more fuel to accelerate all that cargo to Mars, but it also means carrying more fuel to stop when the ship reaches the planet. In addition to all the fuel necessary to return to Earth, we are talking about hundreds of tons of fuel that we will have to carry to Mars in some form. One option that some scientists propose is to use the minerals and gases trapped in the subsoil of Mars to produce fuel, but so far no system has been tested that can do this. So until we prove that something like this is possible, the only option will remain to use our fuel. And for the distances we've talked about, as well as for the round trip, in total the Mars mission will require carrying between 850 and 1,250 tons of fuel. This is a massive amount if we consider that the ISS has a mass of about 420 tons and that a ship with which we are familiar, the Space Shuttle, can only send into space between 15 and 25 tons approximately, depending on the altitude of the final orbit. The Ariane 5 can put about 20 tons in low orbit around the Earth, like the Russian Proton rocket, with the most powerful ships of the time taking all that fuel into space would take us about 10 trips at least. Thus, we can already intuitively anticipate that a single rocket will not be able to be used to go to Mars, but that several rocket launches will be required, as powerful or more powerful than the Saturn V of the 60s, to assemble in space different propulsion elements, fuel modules, habitats and ships, which will have to be sent to Mars separately and in advance, in addition to the spacecraft with the crew which would be sent last. Although it depends on various factors, they will require, in fact, 10 rocket launches with the capacity of the Saturn V or similar. But remember, the total number of Saturn V rockets sent to the Moon in the entire Apollo program 
was 9. The Saturn V was retired from service after the Apollo program, but holds the record even today as the most powerful operational rocket ever, capable of putting just over 120 tons into low orbit around the Earth and sending 50 tons to the Moon. It had to be specifically designed and built in its day to reach the Moon. The only rocket capable of dethroning the Saturn V could be the SLS rocket space launch system which will have a similar or perhaps somewhat superior performance than the Saturn V. The Effects of Weightlessness A time of 539 days out in weightlessness profoundly affects human physiology, especially worrying when arriving on a planet where no one can assist you. The ships that can be seen in the movies with spacious and comfortable cylinder-shaped cabins rotating to simulate the acceleration of gravity do not exist today so astronauts who will go to Mars will suffer from weightlessness throughout the mission. It is not yet known precisely how they will recover when they reach Mars. For psychological reasons, two and a half years is a very long time. Earth will be seen by the crew as a star-like point of light for most of the voyage and barely noticeable on Martian night. The crew will have to live in a condition of permanent confinement in a small space in a situation of great stress and with the impossibility of maintaining fluid conversations with loved ones on Earth due to the signal's travel time. Remember that radio signals travel at the speed of light, which is the speed limit in the universe. Still, even at that speed, communications have a delay of 8 minutes between message and message due to the enormous distances the signals must travel. Conversing with a loved one in real time from Mars will be practically impossible. To these problems must be added all the technical, technological, and operational difficulties involved in taking a human crewed ship to such a remote place. No human being has ever experienced such a large journey. The astronauts will spend months in weightlessness, subjected to radiation from interplanetary space. Once on Mars, they will face other challenges that are very difficult to overcome, such as the fact that they will be locked 24 hours a day in a cabin probably equal or even smaller than the ship they used to get there. Although some enthusiastic and optimistic people about interplanetary travel say that humanity already has the technology and everything it takes to go to Mars, science tells us that we are not ready yet. The difficulties and challenges that arise from interplanetary travel are still considerable and difficult to overcome, but we may have the technology to achieve it. We only need the budget and time to plan things well. NASA has estimated that with modern science and technologies, it will be possible to take the first humans to Mars before the end of this century. Others think that in reality, there is much more to be done than that, and the most optimistic think that it will be achieved in the coming years. What do you think? Do you think we will be able to get humans to the moon very soon, or do we have many problems to solve? Let us know what you think in the comments of this video. Is it challenging to get to Jupiter? Why have we never seen its interior? Jupiter is the most visited gaseous planet of all. Throughout the history of space exploration, it has been visited by nine spacecraft. However, so far only one ship has managed to cross its dense atmosphere to observe its interior. Is it tough to land a spaceship on Jupiter? What's inside the gas giant? The problem with speed. Jupiter is the fifth closest planet to the sun, but it is not so complicated to get there despite being very far away. Because of the fact that it is the planet with the highest mass, its gravitational attraction force is vast. And thanks to that, spaceships do not work hard once they enter its gravitational field. But this is also a problem. Getting to Jupiter is relatively easy. But putting something into orbit around the giant planet is a more significant challenge. In 1979, the Voyager space probe took 1,546 days to reach Jupiter. But to get so far, the spacecraft had to acquire a very high speed. A trip traveling so fast cannot remain in orbit around any planet since it will follow its course. To place a spacecraft in orbit around any celestial body, it must adjust its speed. It must not go too fast to escape the gravitational pull or too slow to be trapped by gravity and plunge into freefall towards the surface of the planet. The Voyager probe was too fast to be captured by Jupiter's gravity. 
to get into orbit, it would have to make use of rockets to help it slow down slowly. But at that time, the Voyager probes did not have such rockets equipped. Future missions that reached Jupiter did count on these rockets to slow down and enter orbit around the gas giant. Requirements to reach Jupiter successfully In general, flights to other planets in our solar system are accompanied by high energy expenditures. For a spacecraft to reach Jupiter's orbit from Earth, it requires about the same amount of energy that it would require to lift it off from Earth's surface and place it in low Earth orbit. However, gravitational assistance can sometimes be used to help space probes, requiring less energy at launch, although this procedure significantly increases the time of the mission, which eventually means that the spacecraft must be equipped with some resource that allows it to replenish energy during the long journey, either with solar panels or thermal nuclear energy sources. An even bigger problem is that Jupiter has no solid surface on which to land. Because of its gaseous composition, there is a smooth transition from its atmosphere and its inner fluid. But the atmosphere is so large and heavy that any space probe descending through Jupiter's atmosphere would eventually be destroyed by the immense pressure and reduced to dust. Another problem is the amount of radiation a probe is exposed to reaching the planet, given the harsh particle charges around Jupiter. For example, the Galileo probe has orbited it for several years and has had markedly exceeded the amount of radiation for which it was designed. As a result, the scanning probe has suffered various technical problems and failures attributed to unrepaired radiation effects. Our Visits to Jupiter Pioneer 10 and 11, 1973 and 1974 Pioneer 10 was the first space probe to explore Jupiter, which did so in December of 1973, followed by Pioneer 11 13 months later. The Pioneer 10 probe was the first spacecraft in history to take the first images of Jupiter from up close, thanks to which we could observe that Jupiter was covered with storm clouds that could not be seen clearly from Earth. Pioneer 10 also took images of the Galilean satellites Europa, Io, Callisto, and Ganymede. It observed its atmosphere and radiation belts, which extended several thousand kilometers from the planet. Thanks to this mission, Jupiter's magnetic field was detected, which extends so far that all the solar system planets could fit inside it. Another discovery that we owe to the Pioneer probes is that, thanks to temperature lenses, it was possible to corroborate that Jupiter is mainly liquid. That is to say that instead of being called a gaseous planet, it should be called a liquid planet, since its main composition is metallic liquid hydrogen. Pioneer 11 was the first probe to take sharp images of the Great Red Spot. It made the first observations of its polar regions and obtained the first close images of the satellite Callisto, which is wholly covered with active volcanoes. Voyager 1 and 2, 1977 and 1979 The famous Voyager exploration probes traveling to the solar system's far reaches also used Jupiter's gravity to gain speed. Voyager 1 began photographing Jupiter in January of 1979 and made its closest approach on March 5, 349,000 kilometers from the planet's center. Because of its higher resolution and shorter distance, most observations of moons, rings, magnetic fields, radiation, and the environment were made during the two days the probe was closest to the planet. The Voyager missions improved the understanding of the Galilean satellites. They contributed to the discovery of the rings of Jupiter that, until then, no one had seen because they are too thin to be detected with a telescope from Earth. Before the Voyager missions, Saturn was believed to be the only planet with asteroid rings. The probes took the first images of its atmosphere and revealed that the Great Red Spot is an anti-cyclone moving counterclockwise, in addition to other smaller storms near the main one. These missions discovered the Adrastea and Matisse satellites orbiting close to Jupiter's rings, being the first moons of that planet to be discovered by a spacecraft. The third was Thebe. Together, the two Voyagers recorded great volcanic activity on the Io satellite, a total of nine volcanic eruptions with evidence of others occurring between the encounter with the two probes. An unexpected discovery concerning Jupiter and becoming the first observation of active volcanoes in another planet besides Earth. In Europa, hundreds of lines were discovered and initially considered acts attributed to tectonic movements. 
However, thanks to the photography of Voyager 2, it was determined that the true origin of these cracks was because Europa is a moon with geological activity, and that it has at least 30 kilometers of crust in the form of a thick layer of ice. It is currently thought that beneath all of Europa's ice, there could be an ocean of liquid water. Ulysses, 1992 The Ulysses spacecraft was designed as a five-year mission to study the sun's never-before-examined north and south poles. Ulysses became one of the most prolific contributors to knowledge of the solar wind, interstellar dust, and the three-dimensional character of solar radiation, far exceeding the lifespan of its planned mission by 13 years and collecting treasure troves of data on the solar wind, interstellar dust, and the solar activity cycle. The spacecraft also performed several technical feats, including an unprecedented gravitational assist maneuver on Jupiter to launch out of the elliptical plane and enter its solar polar orbit. After the probe's launch, Ulysses headed to Jupiter. It arrived in February of 1992 for the gravity assist maneuver that placed the spacecraft into its unique solar orbit that no other spacecraft had done before. Thanks to this, the probe managed to leave the plane of the ecliptic, where all the planets rotate and pass over the south pole of the sun in 1994 and the north pole in 1995. Beginning at second orbit of the sun, Ulysses revisited the south pole in 2000 and the north a year later. At the time, the sun was near the peak of its 11-year activity cycle. Ulysses then returned to Jupiter's orbit on the long stretch of its six-year circuit around the sun. The mission ended on June 30, 2009, after disconnecting the probe remotely, unable to carry out further significant scientific activities due to the depletion of its nuclear power source. Galileo, 1995 So far, Galileo has been the only space mission to venture deep into Jupiter. During the mission, a large amount of information was gathered about the planet and its system. However, it was not as large as expected due to a failure in deploying the probe's transmitting antenna. Significant events during the eight years the mission covered included multiple flybys of all Galilean moons, including Almathea, the first probe to do so. In part, it witnessed the impact of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 as it approached Jupiter in 1994 and sent back atmospheric proof of the planet in December of 1995. An atmospheric probe was deployed from Galileo in 1995, which entered the planet's atmosphere on December 7th of that year. After descending with an immense G-force, it was destroyed by atmospheric pressure and temperature after crossing 150 kilometers of the atmosphere and collecting data for 57.6 minutes. The probe was subjected to 22 times the Earth's temperature at 153 degrees Celsius. It is believed that the probe was melted down and probably evaporated by the high temperatures, turning it to dust. Later, the Galileo probe ran with the same fate, although more quickly, after being deliberately directed towards the planet at 50 kilometers per second to prevent any failure to cause the probe to fall on the satellite Europa, contaminating it with human space debris. Among the scientific results obtained by Galileo, is the first observation of ammonia clouds in the atmosphere of a planet other than our own. The atmosphere creates clouds of ammonia ice from materials from the depths. It also confirmed the extensive volcanic activity that was suspected on Io, a hundred times greater than the Earth, considering the heat and its frequency as an example of what the Earth was in the past. On this moon, it also observed the complex plasma interactions of the atmosphere, which gives rise to electric currents similar to Earth's thunderstorms, but thousands of times larger. It also provided evidence confirming the existence of a liquid ocean under Europa's surface ice. It made the first detection of a large magnetic field around a satellite, Ganymede, something completely unexpected since, until then, it had never been seen that a satellite could have such a large magnetic field. The Galileo probe also provided evidence of magnetic fields suggesting the presence of salty oceans beneath the surface of Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, as well as a thin atmospheric layer on all three moons, called the exosphere, indicating that all three satellites have a high probability of harboring both liquid water and possible living things inside. Cassini-Huygens, 2000 In 2000, on its journey to Saturn, 
Cassini-Huygens approached the planet, providing some of the highest quality images of Jupiter to date. One of the main findings of the space mission was announced on March 6, 2003 about the atmospheric circulation of Jupiter. The dark belts alternate with the illuminated areas of the atmosphere. For a long time, scientists believed that the areas with their pale clouds were the regions from which air emerged into the outer atmosphere, similar to how it happens on Earth. However, analysis of Cassini-Huygens images show that individual storm cells arise in bright white clouds, too small to be seen from Earth. New Horizons 2007 On its journey to Pluto, New Horizons approached Jupiter for gravitational assistance. While on Jupiter, it made detailed measurements of the inner moons, in particular, Almathea. It measured the volcanoes of Io and studied the Galilean satellites, as well as other moons such as Himalaya and Alara. The probe also studied the planet's little red spot, magnetosphere, and thin ring system, as well as taking infrared images that helped better understand its atmosphere. Juno 2011 The last mission to reach Jupiter was Juno. This probe was designed to study the planet's atmosphere, origin, structure, and evolution within the solar system, and thus better understand its formation. Its main functions are focused on creating a study and map of gravity in its magnetic fields, Jupiter's auroras, and its magnetosphere. It will also study clues about the planet's formation, its core, water in the atmosphere, its mass, and its winds, which can reach speeds of up to 618 kilometers per hour or 384 miles per hour. Currently, the Juno probe continues to orbit Jupiter on a safe trajectory that protects it from the intense radiation emitted by the gas giant, and is expected to continue operating for at least six more years. When Juno's mission ends, it will have the same fate as Galileo. It will intentionally crash into Jupiter so that it does not contaminate other satellites, such as Europa, which can harbor water. According to experts, future missions to Jupiter will not be to study the gas giant, but to study its moons. In fact, the European Space Agency already has a date for such a mission, and it is called JUICE, which means Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, a mission that will take off in April of this year and that will aim to make a detailed observation of the gas giant planet and its three large oceanic moons, Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa, with a set of remote sensing instruments for organic matter. The mission will characterize these moons as planetary objects and possible habitats that could be humanity's following settlements. 